Hello and welcome along to Al's Geek Lab. This is a crystal, a crystal oscillator. This particular one is not special in any particular way. It oscillates at 32 megahertz, which is what, 32 million times a second or something like that? Somebody in the comments, please tell me if I'm wrong there. Anyway, it's a normal crystal. It sits on a printed circuit board and it tells the, uh, the chips on it how quickly to operate. So basically sets the frequency for all the things on that printed circuit board in line with this. Now, the biggest problem with these things is that they are set at a particular frequency. As I say, this one is 32 megahertz. It could be 100 megahertz, it could be 50. It's really depending on the one that you buy. And usually the one that you buy comes on the printed circuit board. You don't get a choice. Now, some people obviously are smart and they can desolder them and they can get a different frequency and stick that one on there. Imagine this though, imagine if you didn't have to choose different ones. Imagine if you wanted to change the frequency as much or as little as you wanted. That would be a cool thing. Now, up until today, I didn't know that such a thing existed. And I don't think a lot of people would know that such a thing existed. A programmable oscillator. My good mate, Jacob, over at Monotech PCs. By the way, this is not an ad. It just so happened that I was on the lookout for a bunch of oscillators, different frequencies that I would solder and desolder until I found a good speed. I wanted that for my Intel inboard 386 because then I could adjust the speed that it was operating to find the speed that would probably work a little bit better. I needed a different speed of clock for the Intel inboard. And Jacob said, I've got something better for you. Jacob showed me his little gadget. And I gotta tell you, this is kind of like life changing for some people who need to change crystals quite a lot to test things out at different frequencies, different speeds. So if you're a person that plays with retro computers quite a lot and you find that you have to desolder and solder on different crystals running at different speeds, this little baby allows you to set it dynamically at any speed you want. So let's have a look at how we can use this dynamically set oscillator on the Intel inboard 3D6 in the machine behind me. But of course you can attach this to any of your projects that have a fixed speed crystal in them, which I'm sure are many. And you can tell me in the comments as well how handy that would be for you. If you're interested, by the way, in ordering one of these, they're just about to go live on uh, Jacob's website, Monotech PCs, and I'll put the link in the description for you. Now, let's have a look at how we fared with this little gadget. So these are the three little buttons. Yeah. And you, to change the setting, you just say you want to change the middle digit, to mm. set the middle digit. Then either of the side buttons, you can just go up or down. Oh my goodness, that is so freaking cool. Hit the, hit the button for that digit again to save it. Or this one, say, like that. Now it's on 40. Right, so the middle button sets and unsets basically in the, the no, one the, on the right. The button for the digit. So yeah. oh, if you right, want to change okay. that one, you hit that one. Right. And then the other two buttons become up and down. Oh, right. So you, okay. And then you hit it again to save. Right. Or, or for that digit. Now these ones is up and down. So how do you actually change the like, speed of the oscillator itself? Like, How is that magic going? Um, it has a PLL based clock generator and a tiny microcontroller. And the microcontroller just tells the PLL what frequency to make and it can make anything from... Oh, I have to check the speed of the digital. Display, yeah. Yeah, so that's all I programmed it to be able to do, but I think it can go up to like 160 if I had more digits. You are a genius. <laughs> that's so cool. This is going to solve a lot of problems for a lot of people. That's so good. Now at this point, you may be wondering, why do I want to change the speed of a crystal on a board? And which board? Well, if you've been following along on the channel, you'll have noticed that I've been trying my best to squeeze every ounce of performance out of the Intel inboard 
386. The Intel inboard, for those of you who have not been watching, is a card that you can pop into a PC, like the original IBM PC from 1981, or an XT, the 8-bit bus machines, that ran at 4.77 megahertz. Really blooming slow. But the Intel inboard 386 actually gives it a new lease of life. It gives you a 32-bit processor, the 386, and you slot it right inside the ISA bus of the original motherboard, so no modifications required. And all of a sudden, you've got a 386 processor running at 16 megahertz. Now, while 16 megahertz compared to four on a 16-bit system, it's night and day. It's a massive, massive difference. But if you've ever tried back in the day to run Doom on a 16 megahertz machine, well, it will start, but you can't play it. It's a slideshow. And so you've watched the previous videos, you'll have seen my attempts at putting a slightly faster CPU in there and then another CPU in there. And in the last video, I got the 96 megahertz Blue Lightning 3 in there. Nuts. But interestingly, when it was running at 96 megahertz, I perceived that it was having performance-based problems. And the performance-based problems is somewhere probably on the Intel inboard. Like it just cannot take all that data going down that bus. It just blew lightning speeds, right? 96 megahertz is just too much. Now I spoke with the guy who originally sold it to me and he actually told me that I might try different clock speeds and that 80 megahertz might actually be a sweet spot. So my job today is to take this clock down speed from 96 to 80, all the way down to 80, in the hope that that might give us some performance increase. I know it sounds weird to slow something down to gain performance. But that is the hope of today. So not only am I doing kind of this cool thing with this dynamic speed uh, oscillator here, but I'm also changing the speed of the machine down to see if it will go up. Bear with me. Well, guess who's sponsoring today's video? None other than PCBWay, of course. And why would PCBWay want to sponsor today's video, I hear you ask? Well, that's pretty simple, because if you have a look at all the printed circuit boards on this video, then it makes sense if you would want to make something kind of like what Jacob does, then PCBWay are the people to go to. They can put all the PCBs together for you, they can do CNC machining, they can do sheet metal fabrication, and any PCB project that you might have in mind, and you can get started from just $5. But this month, in September of 2025, they have not one, but two specials. Number one special is the free purple solder mask. That's really hard for a Scotsman to say, but purple PCBs do look incredible and usually come at a premium, but not this September. For the entire month, PCB Way are making their eye-catching purple solder mask completely free of charge. Get that standout professional look for your boards without the extra cost. The second one, of course, is the 3D printing special. There's massive discounts on a flexible TPU. So if you need durable, flexible parts, then the September Spotlight is on the TPU FDM printing. The deal is simple. The higher the weight, the more you save. Enjoy discounts that scale with the weight of your order all the way up to 80% off. So there you go, not one, but two deals for you this September at PCB Way. So don't forget to check them out, pcbway.com. That's pcbway.com. And we thank PCB Way for sponsoring Al's Geek Lab. Now let's get back on with the video. Get the flux pen on after tinning it. Need a little help. Do you find these flux pens work well? I've got one myself. Yeah, they do. Um, before that, I used a syringe like um, gel flux, mm. but um, the residue that left behind ended up corroding boards like a year later. Oh. So that, 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 I definitely don't use that anymore. <laughs>
So what we reckon is that you need to do a cold boot every time you make a change to this, otherwise it doesn't really see the setting for whatever reason. So we've changed it from slash three to slash two, so that should be a two times multiplier. So hard switch off rather than a soft switch. And this time we should get a speed of 64, right, 64. Yes, 64. 64. Good. Excellent. The next part, put the new super duper crystal thingy in it. Mm. Easy as that. Right, so it's set to 40. Let's go. 40. We have a green light is running. And then you can change it on the fly and see, watch the bench mac increase as you go. <laughs> it, the, as it, it changes cleanly enough for that and then on the yeah. flat sixes. Yeah, all right, here we go. We're looking for 80 megahertz speed here. Yay, yes. There you go, 7.4 versus 7.2. Not not an incredible difference, but certainly a difference. We could, yeah, we could try increasing the CPU a bit, but I think it'd be interesting to see what Check It thinks as well. 82 megahertz. 26130 dry stones. Oh, we got a RAM here. Ah! Like 45. All right. After a crash at 45, we'll try 42. So we're at 84 megahertz actual. Yeah, and it's saying 87, which is pretty. It's always off though. Yeah. Check it. Let's see then if the 3D bench is faster. Oh, here we go. Yay! We got 11.1. Yeah, Amazing. All right. We know 45 is bad. Yep, 42 seems fine for a short amount of testing so far. Yeah. 43 may work, but that's probably pushing it. 43, and it stopped, it locks up straight away. Okay, so this board does not like you changing it on the fly. No. Going for 43. It might have the fastest single 386 ever. Unless people have been playing with 43 megahertz obscure crystals. I mean, there's not that many people out there with inboards. No. So to get a strange speed like 43 is kind of out there. Can you remember the number? It was 7.5 before. 7.5. Might not be a big enough increase to see 7.6. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just, we need another decimal place. So it might be faster, it might not be faster. I guess we could look at... I'm, I'm almost certain it is faster, just not enough for that benchmark. Yeah. 28193, that's faster. I'm pretty sure it was like 26.9 something before. Someone on Blue Sky by the name of Frank reached out to me and said to me that they had created a utility called CPU ID CPU dash Z for DOS and uh, wanted me to give it a try. So Frank, here you go. Thank you very much for making the utility and it clocks in at 85 megahertz. Uh, what do you think? That figure is pretty much the same when you look at Norton Sys Info and also on the CPU identification utility in DOSBench. I think what I found next when I was running the old school PC benchmark from Jim Leonard top bench is this result. I couldn't believe it when I saw that my machine was being correctly identified as an IBM PC XT with an inboard 3D6 and a Cyrix 4D6 blue lightning chip. So somebody out there has pretty much the same spec as me and has saved it uh, to the top bench database and uploaded it for everyone. So that's wonderful. Really cool to see that. For a bit of hilarity, I thought I'd run Landmark System Bench and uh, bench it against an AT. It came out at 250 megahertz uh, versus an AT. So that was quite good. 
But now, really, what you want to see is Doom, of course. Like all of these videos, I end on Doom. So here's uh, Fast Doom, of course, running on the XT mod that I uh, showed you uh, in a previous video. So if you haven't seen that, then check it out. But here it is in full uh, definition mode or full detail mode. And you can see in the demo here, I'm getting about eight or nine frames per second full detail of course so let's start up the game and see what it's like actually playing it in full detail yep here at level one i'm getting again this pretty pretty much the same i'm getting about nine to ten frames per second now i want you to remember what it looked like on the previous setup it was giving me about two to three frames per second it was tragic. I mean, still it played, but you didn't want to play it. So it definitely is playable. It's 9 to 10 frames per second. It's not great. It's a little bit chonky, but obviously um, the big thing was I didn't want to play it on potato mode, but play playing it in uh, low detail is actually plenty playable. So let's have a look at that seeing here about 16, 17 frames per second, even going up to 18, and absolutely playable. Um, before there, in that hallway, I was getting about 9 or 10, and quite, quite a lot here, I was getting 18, 17 frames per second. So, as you can see, moving about, no problem at all. If I wanted to play it on potato mode, uh, which you have probably seen before if you've been watching these videos, you can get up to 33 frames per second. I mean, that is decent, absolutely decent. Well, there you have it anyway. I never thought for one second that I would be going faster by going slower. And as you can see, I'm pretty much pushing it to the limit here. I reckon if I pushed it one more megahertz, it would probably crash again, the memory errors or something like that. So I think this is about as fast as I'm going to get this system without changing perhaps the